Over the past some months, there has been a great deal of concern about where our nation stands in its program for the manned exploration of space. This has been brought about partly by the spacecraft fire in which three astronauts lost their lives, partly by the events of the times. It is appropriate, therefore, to look back over the past several years and review manned space flight in general and Apollo in particular. For only in this context can the program be seen in perspective. In 1961, the President and the Congress committed the United States to the goal of a leading role in space to be demonstrated by a manned journey to the moon. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. In the months immediately following, the most skilled men in the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and American industry devoted well over one million hours to determining how best to achieve manned flight to the moon. By 1963, when Mercury, the nation's first manned spaceflight program, was drawing to a close, a master schedule of nine milestones had been established for Gemini and Apollo and it was subsequently presented to Congress in almost exactly these words. These were to be the key events, the basis for planning and scheduling throughout the remainder of the decade. In Gemini, every one of four milestones was met on or before the scheduled date. On April 8, 1964, the first Gemini flight, an unmanned mission, was successfully conducted, proving out the entire vehicle structures and the launch vehicle systems. On March 23, 1965, the first Gemini manned flight was launched, and it was proven that the spacecraft was a qualified vehicle for flight crews. Two weeks before the beginning of 1966, the first Gemini rendezvous flight was accomplished, a historic event in space operations. Six weeks before the beginning of 1967, Gemini operational status was attained when the last manned mission was completed and much of the equipment was turned over to the Air Force. In meeting these milestones, the six major objectives of Gemini were fulfilled, all necessary for the confident continuation of more advanced manned space missions. In the order they were presented to Congress, these objectives included proving that man could live and work in space for up to two weeks, developing techniques to rendezvous and dock with target vehicles in space, making certain that the flight path could be controlled either manually or automatically during the blazing re-entry into the atmosphere, learning to work outside the spacecraft and accomplish meaningful tasks such as the activation of experiments, developing proficiency and depth of skills of both ground and flight crew personnel. And finally, conducting scientific work in space. For example, acquiring some 2,000 photographs of scientific and economic value. Equal to the major objectives in importance were the experience and confidence that grew out of overcoming problems during missions. Gemini 8, for instance, began to spin out of control shortly after joining with its Agena target vehicle in space. But the flight crew quickly solved the problem, regained control, and flew the spacecraft to a pinpoint emergency landing in the Pacific Ocean. Gemini was brought to a successful close after 12 missions, two unmanned, 10 manned. United States astronauts had now spent a total of almost 2,000 hours in space, and more than $100 million worth of operational Gemini equipment was transferred to the Department of Defense manned spaceflight program. In Apollo, two of five milestones have been met. One on February 26, 1966, when the first Apollo Saturn I unmanned flight was conducted, proving structures and systems.
the second on November 9th, 1967, when the first Apollo Saturn V unmanned flight was launched, validating many of the most fundamental premises of the program. However, in 1967, plans for the first Apollo Saturn I manned flight received a setback in the wake of the spacecraft fire. At the present time, major efforts are directed at overcoming that setback and at achieving in 1968 the first Apollo Saturn V manned flight. And at attaining in 1969 Apollo operational status. It was on the night of January 27, 1967, that fire broke out in the spacecraft command module scheduled for the first Apollo Saturn I manned flight. Subsequently, a number of improvements were incorporated in the spacecraft to increase reliability and safety. For example, there is a new hatch which can be opened in seconds so that astronauts can escape in the event of an emergency on the ground. Electrical cabling has been rerouted and redesigned. Plumbing joints have been reinforced. Fireproof containers have been installed for stowing potentially flammable articles. Further, checkout and operating procedures have been re-evaluated and refined to increase safety. Similar improvements have been incorporated for the spacecraft lunar module. In early 1968, one year after the fire, not only had all required changes been made for the Apollo spacecraft, Virtually all testing of those changes was nearing completion as well. There have been no tests more important than the extensive series designed to assure that the present spacecraft command and lunar module cabins are as safe from fire as possible. The purpose is to make certain that fires from almost any potential source will tend to localize and die out rather than spread. For the tests, the fires are of course ignited intentionally. Concurrent with the efforts to assure that the spacecraft is as safe and reliable as possible, progress continued in the final development of the capabilities to meet the remaining Apollo milestones. For the spacecraft, functional and structural tests in simulated space environments were being conducted to qualify hardware for manned Earth orbital and lunar flights. For the Saturn V launch vehicle for the lunar mission, development and qualification of all systems were essentially completed, and major problems with the second stage were overcome. The last of the major ground test facilities were activated, for example, the final Saturn V static firing stand. Launch Complex 39, the site where the lunar mission will begin, was completed and put into service. The Mission Control Center was equipped for Apollo missions and put into operation. Virtually all the world encircling tracking facilities, for example, ground stations, tracking ships, and tracking aircraft were completed and activated. Dozens of major computer systems which mathematically unify facilities, flight equipment, and mission operations were integrated throughout the manned spaceflight global network. Ground and flight personnel were being trained for the myriad complex tasks of conducting manned Apollo missions. Unmanned missions to the moon have sent back data indicating that the lunar surface is safe for manned landings. A laboratory designed especially for handling flight crews, equipment, and lunar surface samples returned from the mission to the moon was completed and in checkout. With the growth of the manned spaceflight capability, it may now be said that the great new American enterprise undertaken in 1961 has, in 1968, brought the nation to the very doorstep of the clearly leading role in space achievement. This was to be convincingly demonstrated on November 9, 1967. This was the unmanned first launch for the Apollo Saturn V space vehicle for manned flight to the moon. 
equal in size and weight to a u s navy destroyer and it was the first great test of the capability hundreds of thousands of people have worked years to create a major program milestone the space vehicle flew exactly as it was intended to indicating that the more than one million hours expended in conceiving and planning apollo was time well spent the third stage was successfully shut down then reignited in space as required for the lunar mission the spacecraft returned safely to Earth, burning through the atmosphere at a speed even greater than required for the manned lunar mission. With the completion of this mission, every piece of Apollo Saturn V equipment required for manned flight to the moon had been tested in space, with one exception, the lunar module, the part of the spacecraft that will carry astronauts to the lunar surface. However, following extensive checkouts at both the factory and the launch area, a lunar module was launched into space on January 22nd, 1968. rocket motors, its structures, its onboard systems were all to perform successfully. When complete confidence in Apollo and Saturn equipment has been attained in unmanned missions, full attention will shift to reaching the final three major Apollo milestones. The first Apollo Saturn 1 manned flight, the first Apollo Saturn 5 manned flight, both scheduled for 1968, and finally, the series of manned missions which lead to Apollo being declared ready. All will then indeed be ready. Man will set sail across a vast new sea. His destination will be the moon, but the rewards extend far beyond the realization of an ancient dream. For in the development of the ability to fly men to the moon, there is being created a new national resource a resource comprising new talents, new skills, new opportunities. There can be manned space missions to help locate, survey, and manage the natural riches of the Earth with greater efficiency than was ever before possible. There can be manned missions to explore and investigate the moon and eventually other bodies in space. There can be missions to study the sun and the stars, no longer veiled by the Earth's atmosphere. Those are the true rewards of a man journey to the moon.